digital space, it's important to acknowledge where we are representing from. Today, our team is presenting from Neosquiak Cree, or Ermanskin Cree Nation, located on Treaty 6 territory in Ermans in Alberta, Canada. Um, Neosquiak is one of four nations that make up the community of Muscochees that we work in. Adam, Denise, and myself represent the Muscochees Maternal Child and Family Wellbeing Research Group. The MMCFW Research Group has brought together the University of Alberta, Muscochees Health Services, Muscochees Elders, and community members who are passionate about improving maternal health outcomes in Muscochees and rebuilding healthy family structures. We believe in a foundation of relationships based on trust and mutual understanding. Our research is community-based, strength-based, and it includes community members as experts. This is a photo of our community advisory committee taken this year at our iHealthy Think Tank retreat. Our CAC is an essential part of our research. The CAC members are valuable members who make up our group. Um, they are co-researchers and co-learners who help direct the research being done in Muscochis. Luana Listener, Nitsika Son, Neoskweakochinia. My name is Luana Listener. I am from Neoskweak, Ermanskin Cree Nation. And I have been very blessed to be involved in community-based research with my community, for my community, since 2016. The projects I have been involved in include mature women's wellness and aging well, intergenerational cohesion, indigenous gender and wellness, maternity, or pregnancy and maternal health. Currently, I am the research coordinator for this project. It's been very meaningful for me to change, help to change the perspective of research in this community because it's important to me. Now, Denise and Adam will introduce themselves. Uh, good morning, uh, Denise Young, Nitsika Sun. Um, my name is Denise Young. I am an Ermanskin Cree Nation member, just like Luana. Um, so I'm from the community. Um, um, I've been with the group for almost uh, two years now. Um, I'm a mother of three with one on the way. Um, I love my community and I'm excited to share with you all everything that we've learned over the few years. Um, I do have a science background, so um, strength-based research was new to me when I started. So um, I hope you are able to take away some really valuable information today. Go ahead, Adam. Hello, everyone. Akosi uh, Ruel, Nipi Wino Sikasan. My name is Adam. Um, I'm of mixed Filipino and European descent. Uh, so I was born in Camrose, which is not too far from where we are right now, but I grew up in Medicine Hat down south on Treaty 7 territory, um, but now I live with my Lolo and Lola in St. Albert back on Treaty 6 territory up north. Um, I've been the Deadly Dads Helper for the past few years. That's one of the programs to support fathers. That's part of this research project. Um, I just finished my master's in nutrition. Um, and I've really been honored to be mentored here in Muscochese over the past two years um, and to grow with this group as well. So I'm excited to present here today with uh, Luana and Denise. So thank you, everyone. So, oh, I'm not, okay. So a little bit of background from our research group. So our research group has been doing community-based participatory research for over 10 years in the community of Muscochese. So we collaborate with the four nations of Muscochese, Ermanskin, Louisville, Sampson, and Montana Reserves, the University of Alberta, and Muscochese Health Services. So we focus on cultural revitalization and supporting healthy families and the life they bring into this world. We do this by developing and evaluating strength-based based <laughs> community-led and culturally informed strategies to support families through preconception, pregnancy, infancy, and early childhood. So under our uh, bigger umbrella group, we have our Deadly Dads group, and that's the group that um, Adam uh, kind of leads right now. 
we're just transitioning into like having community members take over. Um, so they're best known for being known as Deadly Dads, but on the logo, um, it's Future Father Support Group. Um, so this gr group grew out of the need for support for new fathers in Muscogee's, as the men in our community play just as an important role in healthy family systems. So they just became a not-for-profit. So they're on the road to sustainability and community, which is our ultimate goal with all of our um, projects. And then, so I work more with uh, Eye Healthy. And so that's the Indigenous Healthy Life Trajectories Initiative. So with Eye Healthy, um, we support the healthy family system and it works in tandem with our other programs um, under our research group. So that's the Deadly Dads and the Elders Mentoring Program. And so the Muscogee's Elders Mentoring Program is our Musa Mengukum's program. And uh, that's meant to support expecting and new moms with mentoring from community elders and knowledge keepers. Uh, they began in 2016 at the Wetaskan Primary Care Network. So the, that's a, like a prenatal clinic that's in a town nearby Muscogee's. Uh, by mentoring moms during their prenatal visits, this gave moms an opportunity to learn from our knowledge keepers. And now we are currently transitioning to have this program to be more in the community of Muscatrice and more geared toward cultural and traditional content workshops, which is what the parents want. So now I'm going to hand it over to Adam to talk about the different roles uh, in research partnership. Yeah, so kind of going off of what Denise just shared there, a lot of different people come together for these, um, for this research and for this work, and there's a lot of different roles to consider. Um, and as you could probably tell, you know, the the uniting reason for all of us coming together is based on the Nehiau cultural value of that all our children are loaned to us. So we really focus on using and leveraging research to create opportunities for cultural revitalization that leads to supporting healthy families um, and brighter futures in the community. Um, so that's the vision that really uh, brings us all together. But I want to kind of quickly go through some of our different roles that we consider and who we're accountable to and who we try to keep accountable. So the first are, um, we always come into our meetings thinking of those who came before us um, and all the work that led up to the to the work that we're doing now. Um, and then we have to keep in mind the community uh, today. So that's all the members who aren't part of this research project, um, but, but who, you know, who are really working and prioritizing for. And then as well, we have to keep in mind the generations to come and the people who are gonna carry on this work um, after we're completed. And the way we do that is through our advisory and co-researcher committee. Um, that Luana briefly talked about. Um, and this is composed of Muslims, Kokums, um, researchers that are from community and also um, not from community, from the U of A um, as well. Um, but we're moving in the direction of being led more and more by community. Um, and this is where really all the strengths come from and where we realize, you know, um, where we can make connections and support community. Um, and then uh, as I mentioned, there's some outside research assistants and partners um, and stakeholders, and they're there to support this, these efforts um, and stay accountable to community. Um, and the next thing that I wanted to point out is that the answers through a strength-based approach that we follow uh, really come from community and from, um, from those relationships that we're building, those strong trusting relationships that we're building in community. And the rest of it is there to really support that process. Um, and then on the next slide, what I wanted to share today is some of the several ways to influence the research to keep it on a good path. Because a lot of the times, you know, there's pressures and deadlines um, that can kind of take it out of that um, out of that community priority. Um, but some of the things that I really appreciate about our team that we really brought to the table and that were really centered in our groups was that we always start with ceremony. I mean, we bring that to the forefront because that's where we recognize knowledge from coming from. Um, 
and we see that you know we start with prayer in our uh, community advisory committee meetings um, and we see that with check-ins as well so um, uh, yeah we see that with check-ins as well um, and then the next point that I wanted to get at was um, by, by starting this good way and building these trusting relationships you know it opens up um, the opportunity to ask difficult questions and really question you know um, what is research and how do we do it in a good way? And to be able to do that, you really have to know who you're partnered with and you have to trust the people that you're partnered with as well. And you have to like feel that you're in a good space to be able to do that. Um, and at the bottom there, I won't go through all the details of these uh, different documents, but I just wanted to show that there are different documents that keep um, community priorities front and center in research that can be leveraged. But ultimately, this is a baseline, and um, th they're not to, made to, to bound you to them or to be treated as check checklists, but to be leveraged to keep community priorities front and center. Um, and so on this slide, I really wanted to show that there are ways of enacting power um, as community members to hold researchers accountable. And you know, if you have that trusting relationships and you go about it in a good way and you know a trauma-informed way as Denise uh, will share shortly um, you know this can be a very healing process you know to to be able to speak up in your group and to be able to adapt and keep the research on the, on the right track um, so I think with that I will pass it on to Denise's um, slides on trauma-informed care as well thanks Adam um, so trauma-informed practice, um, practicing trauma-informed care is part of doing strength-based research. It's vital and necessary, especially working with First Nations and Indigenous peoples. Because of the intergenerational trauma that we've endured and continue to experience today. So despite this, you can encounter trauma with other participants from other and different backgrounds. Um, I think what's most important is when you're practicing trauma-informed care that you're not uh, causing more harm. So to always be mindful of the different experiences of everyone involved. And so, um, trauma-informed practice is really about creating safety for all involved. Because not only can we possibly trigger the participant in research, but we can also um, re-trigger ourselves if we've experienced trauma. So, and, and that's through vicarious trauma. So even if we try to avoid creating more trauma or triggering others, like if you're still creating a safe enough space, you can still get disclosures happening. And that can happen not just in research, it could happen in education, in social work, um, in medicine, in health. Um, so ensuring we know how to move forward with best practices is what's important for the well-being of all. And so intergenerational trauma, it's trauma passed down through generations. For example, I myself have gone to day school residential. My parents went to day school residential schools. My parent, Their parents went to residential schools. And one of my grandparents even taught in residential schools. So the long-term effects through the generations are still very much felt in my own family today. So there lies possibility of inciting trauma and re-triggering trauma in participants full of questions we ask. So trauma-informed care is really about um, focusing on the safety of all involved and using intergenerational wisdom and resilience and care that's already present in the community. And so that's how it ties into like the strength based is because we're really offering that safety. Like even though there could be trauma involved, our disclosures that we're using each other and our teams and our support networks, um, we're using the resources in the communities that are already there um, and providing a platform for participants to cope in healthy ways. So the communities, like Indigenous communities already have the solutions. It's really about helping them navigate the supports that are already there. 
So, and having your own research team support each other or whichever team you work with. Um, and it helps cushion any vicarious trauma that could happen. So we took our training through, um, I know, I think it's on the left. Imagine Institute, I think it was. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was a really good group to do the training with. And I'd like, despite whatever uh, organization you work with, I think it's just a really valuable tool to have. Uh, and then, so now I'm going to transition the slide to Luana, who's going to cover our strength-based approach in research. Okay, what is strength-based research? In the past, um, research with Indigenous communities has typically been deficit-based. Seeing research through this lens mainly describes what is wrong with an individual or what is wrong with a person or community. Strength-based approaches seek to move away from the deficit-based research that involves focusing on what's wrong on the deficits, problems, and challenges, and instead moves towards strengths and well-being. Strength-based research is a shift from the focus on deficit-based understandings of individual and social problems towards resilience, healing, and recovery. These approaches promote individual, social, and cultural capabilities for adaptation, resilience, growth, and well-being. It creates an opportunity for individuals and communities to form and achieve their own solutions based on the existing strengths that can be found within the community. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the Nehiwa Cree view of wellness. Strength-based approaches should result in a complete rethinking of the origins and the outcomes of health and wellness. The Nehiwak view of wellness is much more than the biomedical definition of wellness. Rather than focusing on separate factors of illness or challenge, the Nehiwak view of wellness involves the spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, and historical aspects of a person. There is an emphasis on acknowledging that all aspects of a person, the community, and the environment are interconnected. Tending to and finding balance in all areas of a person results in attaining and maintaining wellness. This view of wellness illustrates the strength-based research because it doesn't focus on what's wrong, but rather what can be done to achieve balance and wellness. Okay, next slide. There are three R's of strength-based research. The first R is respect. When researching for and with First Nations communities, it is important to recognize and respect First Nations cultural norms, values, and perspectives. The second R is reciprocity. Research must be mutually beneficial both to the researchers and the participants. The importance of reciprocity for Indigenous research is a result of the harmful practices and the exploitative um, practices on Indigenous peoples of the past. The third R is relevance. Research should be meaningfully connected to First Nations culture and ways of knowing. Relevant research with First Nations should have a basis in both community and oral communication. The fourth R is responsibility. The researchers have a responsibility to recognize and uphold First Nations values practices and ways of knowing. While responsibility towards the indigenous culture and ways of knowing are very important, the application of this fundamental R to a university setting is nuanced by the additional responsibility of meeting institutional needs and requirements. The fifth R is probably the most important and that's relationships because building relationships provides a foundation so that the other four R's of respect, reciprocity, relevance, and responsibility can be actualized. And relationships are meant to be reciprocal. To build trust and long lasting relationships, you need to drink 1000 cups of tea together. This Maori proverb shows that trusting and long-lasting relationships 
take time to build and foster. Our research group, like I said, it be we believe in the foundation of relationships that are based on trust and mutual understanding. Um, we have monthly check or monthly meetings with our CAC, and like Adam said, um, one of the essential part of the of the meetings is the check ins, where we all take turns and we share how we're doing, we share our thoughts and what's going on with our lives. It gives us a valuable opportunity to build into our meetings the importance of relationships. And I like if I could just add something. Yeah, sure. Like I was thinking, uh, we currently just started distributing uh, a Muscat Cheese community guide, and it's a resource guide that we've created for um, Muscat Cheese parents and families with a list of like all the programs, the agencies within the community and outside the community. Um, and even just building that uh, guide was, it took cups of tea, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally. <laughs> with the whole community. Uh, it took almost over a year, I think, for us to finally finish it, because expecting uh, programs into community to just share information with us was unrealistic. We had to build those relationships first, um, and then just collaborate and work together to create the guide that we have now. Thank you, Denise. By working together equitably and developing trusting and respectful relationships, we can transform Indigenous health research and move beyond um, the unique challenges that Indigenous peoples encounter by identifying and highlighting the strengths and resilience that can be found within the communities and incorporating these into relevant solutions. Now, why do we need to do things differently? Um, indigenous people and communities were subject to a very harmful history of mistrust, exploitation, and unethical research. In many Indigenous communities, the word research is a dirty word and it triggers trauma and feelings related to harmful practices of the past. There is a history of misrepresentation in research, um, top-down approaches where the community did not have any input in the research and ideas typically came from outside institutions. Um, there's a history of helicopter research where researchers came into the community, conducted research and left with little or no benefit to the person or the community being researched. And research has um, primarily been deficit based. Um, so focusing on what's wrong rather than um, what, um, what strengths exist already. Um, it is crucial that we do things differently and move towards looking at strengths and solutions that can be found within the community so that the research knowledge that is produced is meaningful in Indigenous contexts. As researchers, we need to make sure that research being conducted uses the strengths found within the community and that the research is meaningful and beneficial for all the people involved. So that means the researchers, the participants, um, yeah, um, using a strength-based approach creates opportunities and solutions that otherwise would not be created by academic institutions. It allows the community to have autonomy over solutions and um, to realize that uh, for all, or sorry, for all involved to realize that these solutions lie within the community. This approach enhances indigenous self-determination. It also empowers people within the community to highlight the strengths each person has and realize the power we have to change their lives and communities in positive ways. And what we do that is strength-based. Everyone here has their own gifts they bring to the table and we are all equal, but we all have gifts. Everyone brings their own gifts to the table. At the camp, we all did different things. There's not one person that did it alone. Muslim Rick Lightning is one of the elders of our CAC. And this quote from Muslim Rick highlights the fact that every community member has their own strengths and gifts. No one is higher or lower than anyone else because everyone has a piece of the puzzle. 
The image of the tree illustrates the community identified strategies that emerged from the research to address the gaps and improve healthy outcomes to rebuild um, healthy family structures. Cree culture, community, and Cree language are the roots that provide a strong foundation and guide us in the work that we do with the community. Culture and language connection for youth and families was prevalent in all feedback from parents and families um, in the community for creating overall family wellness. Community members spoke of the need to reconnect youth to culture and ceremony as a source for restoring healthy family systems. They also named the need for teachings related to Opikina Wasawin, which is good child rearing, land connection and ceremony. Our elders mentoring program and deadly dads will continue to support this connection to culture, language and ceremony. The trunk illustrates resilience, enhancing parents' internal resilience is very critical to becoming a healthy parent. The parent's ability to overcome and heal from intergenerational trauma cannot be overstated in their journey to healthy parenthood. Programs need to consider the development of the parent's internal resilience, as well as parenting knowledge and skills as part of the curriculum. The leaves represent the strength-based work that we are doing in the community, so we have the Elders Mentoring Program, Deadly Dads, the Community Guide that Denise spoke about, and Birth Workers and Midwives. Um, like Denise said, since 2016, the Elders Mentoring Program connected elders with pregnant women and their partners at the local primary care network in Wetaskiwin. Through these interactions, elders were able to provide guidance, compassion, support, and cultural teachings around pregnancy, postpartum, and parenthood to moms and dads from the community. Recently, the PCN or the Elders Mentoring Program at PCN ended, and we are now in a transition period of planning opportunities for the elders to connect with pregnant women in the community, Muskochis. The goal of Deadly Dads is to support Nehio Napeo, which is Cree men during pregnancy and parenting via community-led, culturally appropriate, and strength-based supports. The objective of this research is to understand the impacts of these supports on the well-being of men and their families. Interagency networking is important to create a wraparound support system and to connect families and parents to the existing programs in the community. Next slide. Okay, can I add a bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because I was thinking I, we have a little bit of time because yeah. we're just going through the slides pretty good. Um, but just to give you some context about the diagram there with the tree. Um, so we had a research assistant that had worked with us in the past, uh, Fernanda, um, and she was really great at creating this diagram for us. Um, but how we came up with the theme, the four themes that are there, are actually from like surveys we did within the community. Um, but also interviews with the moms. So when COVID happened, uh, it really took away from the moms and the elders being able to meet one-on-one -on -one and have that mentoring. So it was it was a bit of a, of a challenge and a change for the elders to transition from going to in-person to online because what they ended up planning was workshops online for um parents and community and outside community to join, but they ended up really, really liking it. Um, and so part of the themes on here came out of that research. And so a lot of the interviews with the moms um, and the themes within uh, the community from the surveys uh, just really showed how, again, like strength-based is really looking at those answers that lie within community. And so you have like your Nehio Weiwin, your Cree language, Wagotuin community. But I think what's really important to mention about Wagotuin when you understand the term is it's more than community. It's about kinship. It's about family. It's about your connection to the land. And it's, it's about your connection to all beings, really. Uh, and Nehio Wowin, 
So that's your, like your identity and being Cree. So that's really important to families. Um, so the question we ended up asking was, what do you need um, to be a healthy parent? And so these were the answers that came out. Um, and so Gisuin was a, was a, was a really big one within all, it was underlying uh, as an underlying theme within all the interviews and answers, but it's something that's really important to create people um, is that resilience. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention that the midwives, like we didn't have midwives in Muscochese, like we didn't even know we could access midwives. And so that was a really big, um, a really big change for the community. And it's really beautiful to see because they're starting to like um, incorporate midwife visits and education uh, at the early years, just across from us here. And the early years is uh, someone we're gonna start partnering with for mm -hmm. our elders mentoring program. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give some context to the, because <laughs> we see one diagram and we think, oh, wow, but it's like so many months yeah. of work that went into it. So. Okay, so um, the Deadly Dads group has held numerous strength-based activities in the community to help support men in their traditional family roles. Um, one of the activities they had in the community was the horse therapy. And that's an example of um, a strength that exists in the community to address balance and wellness within an individual. Um, they have their Jasper camp, and that's an example of families getting together to be healthy and rebuild healthy family structures in a supportive and positive environment. Oh, I should have asked Adam. Adam, oh, did you yeah. want to add anything to that slide? Maybe? Yeah, I, I could just add that, yeah, both of those are examples of strength-based because they really came from the group. So horse therapy was is something that already um, was going on in Muscochese. It's led by Muslim Pat Buffalo. Um, and one of our members from the Deadly Dads uh, suggested to the group that we do it together because it's a way to, you know, build relationships and learn about healing that um, people were interested in. And then the Jasper Family Camp, that's another thing that really leveraged things. That quote from Muslim Rick before, that comes from the Jasper Family Camp, where we all really work together, you know, up until up until the very last day organizing and um, even throughout the camp, we were all working together to, you know, make sure everyone was accommodated um, and families were taken care of and could go. So we were organizing like transportation up to the last minute as well. And we're doing it again this week. Um, we're going through that, that same strength-based process um, or next week, actually, the 25th, I think we're leaving. So yeah, those are examples uh, just to speak on a little bit more. And they're, they're still going on. So that's, I think, a positive aspect of it, yeah. Yeah, such great work. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, so we had a Christmas lunch luncheon um, where all the CAC members were invited, and it was a really great opportunity to strengthen those relationships of our group with food, ceremony, and socializing. The Elders Mentoring Program held, held two Elders Tea events in Muscochese this year, and it was a chance to foster intergenerational relationships between the elders and the past participants of the Elders Mentoring Program. It was a wonderful opportunity for the elders to meet the participants and their babies and engage with the community. And then that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we just, this last slide is just um, giving thanks to our partnerships that we have within community with Muscogee's Health Services and the U of A um, and to all our sponsors. So uh, questions, I, uh, Manisha received an email um, from you with questions from the group. Is that something you'd want us to go over now? Yeah, go sure. ahead, please. Yeah, okay. So um, Adam, we got like a list of questions. So um, the first question we have was, uh, how did you decide the research methodology? 
So I don't know if someone wants to answer that or the, yeah, you can go ahead on. Um, I can start because our methodologies were a little bit different for the deadly dads. Um, Cause in, initially we did propose doing individual surveys and interviews. Um, but what we realized as we started to work together was that our support group was really like an open group where people were comfortable sharing and comfortable talking about the research question together. Um, so we decided actually to move towards wisdom circles where we all gathered together. Um, and, you know, we went through our, through the questions and through the context that we wanted to answer. Um, and I think like, it's really about finding the fit with your, like finding the fit with your methodologies and the people that you're working with and the dynamics of the project. So I think like you can, maybe you can speak on this a little bit more, um, Denise, but like with the elders mentoring program, it was very much in a one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction. So interviews, you know, fit nicely with that. Whereas with the deadly dads, it's kind of like a group, it's a group um, support group. So answering those questions together um, fit better that way. Yeah. Um, like I started just a few years ago. So like this, like the methodology that they kind of based on was started with Richard. Mm -hmm. um, Richard's still a part of like our project, uh, Richard Oster. Uh, he's one of our research leads, but he's just uh, more in the background now. Um, but like Adam said, uh, a lot of, we were able to do like one-on-one -on -one interviews with participants because it was more of um, like one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, and then we also did surveys within the community though, but it was really useful tool surveys, but sometimes you don't get that richness that you get in an interview or in a sharing circle. Um, and that's where a lot of our analysis came from, was from those interviews. Um, yeah, I d and do you want to add anything? Um, no, I don't think so. No. And, and that allowed us to, to like really focus on the strength-based aspect of the research, because then we're looking at the answers that already lie within community. We just kind of have to, when we do the analysis, we're kind of having to look for those themes. Um, yeah, so the next question is, what challenges do you face when you are working with Indigenous nations? <laughs> That's um, a good one. Yeah, that is a great, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, for me, one of the challenges when I first started with research was um, have like experiencing that mistrust and that trauma that people have with research. I remember when I first started asking people um, to do interviews, a lot of them were really, really upset with me. I had one person yell at me and they just had like this wall up as soon as I said the word research. So that was a challenge, like overcoming that and building um, trust with these people. Um, another one um, was, let's see, a challenge for me, like just, um, I guess it, it's kind of like along the same thing where um, like people wanted to know, how is this going to help my community? How is this going to help? If I am involved in this, how is this going to help? It was really, really important for people to know that this research wasn't going to leave the community, that it was actually going to be helpful and meaningful. So those were some of the challenges that I um, faced when I first started with research. Um. I think one of the challenges for me was when I first started that uh, being from the community makes it a really can make it really difficult because um, like even though I say like the richness comes from the interviews um, and those sharing circles, like you do get disclosures if you create a safe enough space. And I did experience vicarious trauma um, the first few months I was started with the team and it was it was to the point where I was like crying off and on throughout the day because I didn't realize what I was experiencing. Um, and so there's a lot of trauma in Indigenous communities, but there's also a lot of beauty and a lot of strength in the people here. So learning to build on those strengths, I think, is um, what's really important when working with First Nations people. 
Um, Cause you don't like, you don't have to be from the community to have like a really safe trauma informed approach. Like one of the things I did after the interviews with participants is I checked in on them like a week later just to make sure they were okay. So I let them know I was like, they were heard. Um, Cause it was really sensitive things. Like we had asked the question, um, did you attend residential school or did your parents attend residential school? And that's something our CAC um, decided, like our committee, advisory committee decided was important to ask, but we really didn't break down how we, how, what type of responses we could get or what kind of um, conversations that could open. So that's why I brought up why it's important to practice trauma-informed care, because sometimes we can trigger people and re-trigger ourselves. So it's something to always be mindful of when working with Indigenous communities. Um, um, another thing I wanted to add is like when you're um, planning like your interview schedule with your interview questions, um, like it's important to know, like even if you have, you keep your questions broad, um, there might be, there's still that chance that um, that trauma will be triggered and it will come up during the interview. So just to be aware of that and then handle it in, um, in a positive way. A lot of time it's just letting them know that like, I hear you, I yeah. understand, like I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so Marie, hello everyone, just a question, please. Would you be able to get this presentation online? Um, I'm sure like Manisha can She's share the recording, that. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we'd share it, we'd share it. Uh, and then George, are there times when you teach specific skills? And if so, how do you approach it? I'm thinking of maybe things like parenting and caregiving skills for the Deadly Dads program. Yes, do you wanna maybe answer that, Adam, or? Um, sure, I can start with the Deadly Dads. I know uh, like Elders Mentoring Program also does specific skills, but our approach in the Deadly Dads has always been to like leverage the gifts that are brought to the group and also the interests of the group. Um, so when someone has a question and we're able to make those connections in community, like that was the example of horse therapy um, um, that we attended with some Pat Buffalo. So some like people were interested in learning about healing, um, like through ceremony with horses and also learning about like ownership over well-being and stuff like that. So that was a specific workshop that we reached out in community to organize. Um, another example of that that we did was uh, firearm safety training, which is an important part for a lot of hunters um, or important for a lot of people who don't have those skills in hunting. They were interested in like seeking out that knowledge in preparation for learning about hunting and um, also the upcoming hunting season. So um, usually it's just based on what the group is interested in. Um, and then I will say like a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring happens like as we get together. So if someone has a specific question about being a father or being a dad um, or a specific challenge that they're going through, there's others in the group that they usually reach out to, you know, off to the side or sometimes we sometimes there is like a spontaneous um, sharing circle that happens. And that's also the importance of having um, Muslims there to help guide those discussions and to help provide those insights as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we approach it and we're pretty flexible. And I think we're really lucky as a group to have the people who are all involved um, to be able to do that as well. So I hope that helps answer some of those. Yeah, I, I'm thinking like just building off of that. Um, I think what's really important, George, is that you utilize the programming. Like if you're working with Indigenous communities or any community that you're using the resources that are already there and not trying to compete with maybe creating something new. Um, like Adam, I'm really thankful that he used the horse therapy program because you think horse therapy and you think, oh, it's just horses. But to like <laughs> create people, Native people, there's a spirit to the horse. There's a reason why we use the horse. Um, and um, Muslim Pat Buffalo has a really unique way of doing it. 
Um, I can't even, like, if I were explain, expl to explain to you how he does it, you'd be like, no, you wouldn't believe it. Like, it's, it's almost, it's really spiritual. So it's a spiritual, it's almost like ceremony, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That the men have gone through with that. So that's why it's so important to use the people in the community to, um, to help build off of like, like you said, like parenting and caregiving or parenting skills. Um, we also do like traditional parenting mm -hmm. in the community. And that's something that Luan is planning with the elders right now. Yeah. So um, there's going to be like two different aspects to the elders mentoring program. Um, like I said, we're in a transition period of moving from the PCN in Wetaskiwin to Muskwichis. So we're going, we're planning workshops that have specific teachings in them, like um, traditional cooking, traditional parenting, um, the meanings of ceremonies and um, protocol and things like that, um, rites of passage. And then um, the elders really love having that one-on-one -on -one mentoring piece. So we're going to be partnering with early years to make that possible because they just, they enjoy that one-on-one -on -one with the young moms. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay. So uh, next question is, how do the local First Nations people benefit from your research? I think Adam, like you could probably answer that if you want. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's like a difficult question to summarize because I think there's a lot of ways, um, but I guess I'll, I'll link it back always to our relationships and building those connections. Because um, at the end of the day, I think that's the most impactful part about the research process is, you know, the community coming together as we repeated throughout the presentation, you know, the answers lie in community. And so I think the benefits of, um, you know, research for Musquatchies um, and these projects have really been those connections that continue on and, you know, last, um, you know, long term, like for the, I can't really see how the relationships that were built in the Deadly Dads will really end um, in any real way, you know, they'll keep going even after the project. Um, and then on top of that, you know, there's like the logistical things where we've been able to apply for additional grants and additional funding. Um, so now we have that infrastructure of sustainability, like we um, developed that nonprofit to help navigate that grant funding space um, and to hold funds in community that's decided on in community. Um, so I think, you know, building that infrastructure helps bring control back to community and that's, um, that's one of the additional benefits as well. So I don't know if there's anything else to add to that, uh, Luana or Denise. Like our purpose is always to like create sustainability in the community. So all of our projects, like that's our ultimate goal is to have them eventually not be research anymore and to be programs within the community and guided and be led by community. Um, so all of our uh, reports, analysis, everything will, will always be with, held within community. Like the ownership of the data will be within community. Um, and all of our decision making and our direction of our research is led by community. Mm -hmm. So nothing that we decide to do within research is ever decided on our own. Mm -hmm. And another great thing is like, um, we really focus on um, employing like First Nations community members. Yeah. Um, and we're currently looking for a research <laughs> team lead from community to help guide the next six years of our research. Um, one of the benefits um, with the research um, that I've seen is with the participants themselves, a lot of them after like receiving the teachings or having that mentorship with the elders, um, or even just being connected with culture, language and ceremony and elders, they feel empowered because they know that the, their strengths that are in the community and their um, connected to them. A lot of times it's the first time that they're connected to these um, types of um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So just like I've seen so many um, people like just 
kind of transform when they're involved with the research, like they're more empowered, they're more, um, I guess, driven to find like the positive um, in their life and to be connected with ceremony, culture and language. Yeah, they almost become advocates yeah. themselves mm -hmm. through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, which part of research do you find most challenging? Uh, writing proposals, planning, research design, data collection, data analysis, writing, and communicating. Um, I think, like, initially when we made this presentation, we did this with... Uh, TQDI mm -hmm. and it was much longer and we had a lot more engagement but one of the things that we had talked about was uh, or had yeah we had talked about it it was about um how we collect data in our last phase of our research and that's with our so moving forward in our last phase we're going to be having a cohort um family cohorts that we're going to um be working with for the next hopefully five years because we're already mm -hmm. a year in um but measuring cultural uh wellness our wellness indicators like we've had to change the way we look at wellness and changing sorry there's like no <laughs> way in the um yeah that, i don't know if you want to add anything to that. for me i guess one of the most challenging would be like the data collection just because of that um trauma that could be um could come up during um, during that collection time with um, so just having that awareness to um, what would it be, be um, have that trauma informed care um, for me I guess one of the most and then I, I guess at the same time one of the most um, beneficial thing um, parts of research for me is that engaging with the community. So I, I, for me, I really enjoy that. And it's really meaningful for me to be able to um, talk with community about what we do, um, especially what we do differently, like finding the solutions in the community, being strength-based, community-based. Um, so that's, that's a part of the research that I enjoy, that I enjoy. I think like being fluid about it, right, is not, and not staying static. So that um, like part of our writing proposals, our planning, our research design, that's all run by our community advisory committee. Like that's not something, again, we decide on our own. And even with our data analysis, I think it's really important if you're doing like community-based research um, that you have community people there doing analysis with you because it's really easy to miss things that people from community could see, right? Like we wouldn't have come up with those four themes if we didn't have people within community working with us. Um, yeah, so on. Uh, and then the last question, or what are some ways that um, public libraries can help support the health and well-being of Indigenous families in your community? Uh, well, like what Manisha is doing. <laughs> I think it's a really great way to like sharing that knowledge, right? That sometimes, you know, if you're not in education or in research that you could miss things like this, but it's still very, uh, very, very important to learn about, right? Mm -hmm. Like about the importance of like, where, where can I access these programs? Where can I learn my language? Where can, you know, I didn't know about the elders mentoring program, but now I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you, Manisha. Yes, uh, fantastic. Um presentation and you know what and excellent um answering the question uh, session really appreciate it um there's a question in chat by marie um she, she wrote i really enjoyed your presentation as studying for an indigenous social work degree it has opened my eyes on many things regarding the interviews sharing of stories which is so important um if it is a bigger community, how would you operate? If it was a bigger community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it, how would we operate in what sense? Like with the project? Yeah. Marie, go ahead. You can rephrase yes. your question. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> hey everybody, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you so much for uh, both of you ladies. It was an amazing presentation. Um, yes, the reason why I'm asking the question, I was thinking um, um, being in my uh, almost final year of uh, preparing an indigenous social work degree, uh, something I've noticed when I, I do projects, uh, when it's a bigger community, usually uh, people would prefer, they will go for the surveys because they are thinking a uh, bigger community, the, like the sharing of stories, uh, it takes a longer time. It's rich uh, because of course, you know, the, the um, storytelling being part of uh, the uh, uh, First Nation uh, uh, culture. And that was my question. I was thinking, okay, yes, when it is a bigger community, um, do you take maybe way longer, like two, three years to do it with the sharing of stories or you just do maybe, okay, let's do a survey because it might be faster or easier, if I may ask, of course, thank you. Yeah, so I think what really plays an important role in deciding how you want to collect your research is really focusing on the question you want to ask or the outcomes you want to focus on, right? So, so part of like the reason why we chose a survey is because we were looking more towards the wellness of the whole community um, and wanted to gauge what the community thought they needed to be healthy parents and healthy families. So we thought it would be more appropriate to do a survey. Um, and that was a challenge too, because it happened during COVID. So we had to do it through mm. drive through. Mm -hmm. So we actually lost out on a lot of um, surveys because our consent process was really long. This is and, what I was about to ask you. Exactly. I was thinking about that. Thanks. Yeah. And so we, it was like a two, I think it was almost four pages of consent. And when you're going through a drive through people aren't going to read that. And I don't think that's informed consent. <laughs> people aren't consent. <laughs> and then some people weren't checking off. Yes, I give consent. So mm. even though they took 20 minutes to fill out the survey, we couldn't use it. Um, so one of the things we changed with the last phase of our research is um, making the consent form really custom to the community. Yeah, very yeah. relevant to mm. Yeah, the yeah. community. And say we did, like, if we were going to do a sharing circle, we were even considering possibly doing just oral consent. Mm -hmm. Because that's like in Indigenous communities, like you said, we appreciate sh sharing stories. So, like, oral tradition is more important to us. So, mm -hmm. so we consider doing like oral consent instead of having them fill out a paper and. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. And I hope you'll be doing more of those in the future. Very interesting. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Again, my 